Well, welcome everybody. This is the, the, the first in the series of talks on the Bojangas. Um, quite a lot of you know already a lot about the Bojangas, so if I repeat some of the, what you already know, um, please excuse that, we'll, we'll see how this goes as it unfolds. So the, the Bojangas, they're, very, they're a very ancient uh, tradition of teaching in Buddhism. They originate with the, many of the Buddha's discourses and they were written down, recorded and written down in the 200 years or so after his death. So they go right back to the, the original teachings, the pre-sectarian uh, period of Buddhism, right up to Ahsoka's reign. And they are the um, factors of enlightenment uh, that constitute together the Buddhist path. And I think when we're talking about Mujangas, it's well to bear in mind this is to do with suffering. The Buddhist path is um, to do with understanding suffering, realizing the, that it exists, its origin, that it can end, and there's a path to its ending. So when we're talking about the Bojangas, it's not just a kind of academic exercise, um, partly that may be, but it's, the underlying meaning is something much more profound. They're also, as many of you know, very closely related to the jhanas. Um, just like the, the jhanas, they're spoken of as factors, the factors of enlightenment, seven for the Bojangas and four or five for the jhanas. And that'll become another kind of theme in these talks. But there's also um, a, a cultural side to the bhajankas. In, <coughs> in Buddhist countries, they are embedded in the culture. So people chant the bhajankas not just for, for recollection of the path, but they chant it for healing, uh, or for oneself or for others. So it's actually quite relevant at this time of, of um, what we're dealing with with the virus, the COVID-19 virus. So if you want to use them occasionally for, for yourself or for others, it can be quite helpful, particularly to do dispel fear, which is another characteristic of, of chanting them. Another kind of level of the cultural context in Buddhist countries is that um, they're used, they're related to days of the week and if you enter a, a Buddhist temple you often find a series of seven Buddha Rupas, one for each day of the week and people would choose their own Rupa to make an offering um, on that day, on their birth day, not the birth date but the day of the week. And everyone in Buddhist countries pretty well knows the day they were born. Um, in the West, quite a lot of people don't, but it, it's, it's very easy to find out if you happen not to know, just in a search on Google. So for Monday, the, the day for the Sati, is it, Monday is the day for Sati, the starting point. The thing is, the gesture is the two hands raised, in the Abhay Mudra. Um, this is the old, very old Rupa, 1465. And the, this one is much more modern. Um, quite big, I'm not quite sure how many meters tall that is in Nakhon Rakshasima, Thailand. So this Mudra is uh, supposedly one that comes from dispelling mastery over passions. So if you're born on a Monday, it's, um, it's considered that you might have a special affinity for Sati. I don't know how many of you were born on a Monday, but um, 
what that might mean for you is something for you to, to explore. So if you're born on a Monday, that special affinity you can interpret in various ways. I mean, you may feel that you've got a special affinity naturally very mindful, or you might feel that you're, um, you're actually very unmindful and it's a sort of reminder that it's something you've got to work on. Whichever way around, there's always this connection. You can work out a connection to suit you. So, Sati, the first of the Bhujangas, it's a starting point. We've got to start somewhere. And you could say it's the beginning of a process to simply waking up. Of course, in, the, in terms of the factors of enlightenment, the waking up is, is realization um, or enlightenment. But the first step is start, has to start in quite a simple way of an act of mindfulness so that we know where we are as a starting point. So whenever we go on, on any journey, mindful, sorry, meditation or, or any journey in life, we have to know where we start from. Otherwise, we, uh, we could be just going around in circles. So if you're driving a car, you put your pulse card in the, in the sat-nav and, the, and it works out how to get from, from A to B. The meditation too, it sets a direction. And that actually means that the moment you give attention to, say for example, the breath, the counting, the touching, or whatever it is, let's say the counting, as soon as you give attention to the number one, two, or three, we establish a <clears throat> location in time and space. There's a marker in time in the um, stream of consciousness, and there's a marker in space because at that moment when you establish mindfulness, you become a subject self-consciousness and because we're embodied in a body and the environment there's an automatic marker of space so there's a marker in time and space so without that starting point we're pretty well lost you know in your car you could be going around in circles on the north circular or the n25 <laughs> or in, in meditation you could become very, very confused and drift off into, into thinking, the, the kind of everyday things. So the difference in meditation is we make it conscious. We, take, we make a, an effort to turn the attention away from the world or sensory inputs to the breath. I mean, in, in ordinary everyday consciousness, mindfulness is there all the time, up and down, fluctuating something comes into our awareness, it's strong enough to capture our attention at that moment, there's mindfulness. But in, in everyday consciousness, it's not very stable, it fluctuates, and it's also mostly reactive. We react to the uh, environment, the senses in our body. But in meditation, we try to make it conscious. And later on, as we go through the, these talks, that means turning away from sensory consciousness. <clears throat> In the very beginning of Naibuman's teaching, which back in 1964 to the Cambridge University Buddhist Society, he, his language maybe wasn't good enough to describe things in detail. And he referred to the practice as mostly uh, mindfulness and concentration. But actually, I think it was more to do with his instinct, not just the language barrier, that he, he held off over the years, even when his English became quite good, from explaining too much, which is actually a very difficult quality for a teacher to have. Um, we tend to talk, uh, talk away and explain things far too much, including me. So while we're talking about this, there may be a lot of facts or detail, but bear in mind that when you go back to your practice or our practice, it's a very simple matter. We let go of all the 
um, cognitive thinking. Uh, and we just go into the practice and make it as simple as we can. I mean, there's obviously a, a benefit to um, Dhamma talks, to reading, to discussing about meditation with, with each other. Um, but it's mostly a cognitive process. And when we sit down to practice, we have to um, let it go. In the, in the moment of meditation, the cognitive process is not terribly useful. The usefulness comes in, it sets a kind of direction for where we're going to go. Anyway, Boomer spoke about mindfulness and concentration uh, pretty well exclusively in describing the practice. So if you started off with the counting, the longest of counting, he would um, describe the um, essence of it as, as, as developing mindfulness. Um, and then as he introduced the, the longer, shorter, and shortest lengths of breath, he might comment that to, to master and go to the shortest lengths, you had to be quite concentrated. So the two were in a kind of reciprocal relationship. He didn't use the word reciprocal relationship. But they were working together, mindfulness and concentration. A lot of the time we didn't really understand what the difference was. Um, but it was useful just to have them somewhere at the back of the head as a vague structure. So when he spoke about the, the longest of counting, for example, And you remember the time when you're learning it. You could say that the, the moment we bring to mind one, two, or three, that moment of contact is, represents concentration because we, we bring our attention down to the, to the number. And so on the longest, one, to up to nine are moments of gathering things together for that moment of concentration. And the awareness of the, the length of breath in the background is mindfulness. So to begin with, this is a kind of cognitive exercise. And what was interesting from the brain study that um, I was involved in or started is to find that actually in modern neuroscience there are there is a kind of direct correspondence between what we understand in meditation and what goes on what's understood in the in the brain so I'll share another um, slide here <laughs> so in neuroscience the understanding of attention came mostly from studying the visual perception and the roots within the brain, what networks become active when we give attention to some, some, some object through seeing. But it actually is much more kind of basic. There are two attention streams in neuroscience, and this is the dorsal stream which is very relevant to what we're talking about with sati, the very first stage of establishing mindfulness. The dorsal stream runs from the back of the head, which is the visual cortex. So it, it extends from the visual cortex around the top of the head. Um, it's called the dorsal stream because of that. It's rather like uh, the shark's fin, you know, on top of the shark. It goes through the parietal lobe which is a lot to do with association of input, sensory input, um, etc. And then it ends up in the frontal lobe, um, which is the cognitive. It contains the, carries the cognitive functions of the brain. And one of the ways of understanding this, this dorsal stream is that it, um, is in terms of a subject-object. The subject at the back of the head 
it, it's almost like the eye, not just the EYE, the visual cortex, but it's our sense of looking, I am. So the subject part is carried in that posterior part of the head. And the frontal part, which is, performs the cognitive functions, is more is carrying more the object goal. So the characteristics of the dorsal stream are well known in neuroscience. In correspondence to what I just said, it's regarded as egocentric as opposed to allocentric, which means more more abstract or all allocentric means picking up on salience. Whereas the dorsal stream is very, very kind of very kind of basic, knowing where you are establishing a point in time space. It doesn't refer to long-term memory. It's held in short-term storage. It's changing all the time. So this is, this is the correspondence to, to Sati in its most basic form, also to Viteka in the jhana factors. So when we move on to the um, second Bhujanga, Dhamma Vichaya, we'll find that the, the, the nature of sati is deepened by Dhamma Vichaya and it corresponds more to Vichara in the jhana factors and there's a different network for that in the brain which is the, the ventral stream which governs salience, long-term memory and so on. So it brings us to an interesting point of how you progress with sati and the, the different factors. Because if you're stuck in, if we stay with the counting, you can learn the technique of the longest, longer, shorter and shortest of counting. But it would be very easy to sit for half an hour or an hour and just repeat. Get very familiar with the technique, but it may not necessarily go anywhere. And it's as well to kind of bear this in mind that how do you make the practice fresh so that it can go, go deeper? And sometimes you can be really taken by surprise, which is one of the reasons on some of the practices you've been on with me, we go into the practice very quickly. And even in one breath, you can find that, to your surprise, to begin with, that you can go very, very deep. You can, you can have a moment where sati just deepens and deepens and deepens, almost to the later stages of developing the pajamas. So while we're talking about sati, to begin with as a basic function, we're setting up a progression where sati gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So the Bhajangas, it's not a matter that we have to master and perfect each one in turn. They, they interact with each other. There is a sequence so that Dhamma deepens Sati to the point of Vichara, to understanding salience. And as we go through the rest of the Bhajangas, you find that the, the same process goes on and on. So that on the left here, these are lots of, there are lots of lists and structures in, in, um, in Buddhist practice, certainly in the Abhidhamma. This is on the left is what Bhumman originally taught. Something very, very simple, mindfulness and concentration. And I've linked them by a double-ended arrow because they're interactive. I mean, ultimately, you can also link mindfulness and concentration to mindfulness to vipassana and concentration to samatha, samadhi. The jhana factors will we'll link these as we go along. Four, four in particular, vitaka, vichara, piti and sukha. And depending on your understanding or your interpretation of the four, four rupa jhanas, qualities of uh, uh, pointiness, samadhi and opeka develop in the later stages. 
And the Bujangas are here, Sati, Dhamma Vichaya, Virya, Piti, Vasadi, Samadhi, and Upeka. And then the Eightfold Path Factors are come in three divisions, Wisdom, Sila, and Samadhi. So the first factor in the Bhujanga Sati, it might start off as something quite basic, directing attention. Then it gets coloured by Dharma Vichaya, then by Virya, Piti, Pasadi, Samadhi, Upeka. Not necessarily in a linear order to begin with, until eventually when it reaches completion, it becomes Sama Sati, right mindfulness in the Eightfold Path. Also in terms of um, the jhana factors, as it becomes more mature and more all-encompassing, it corresponds to upeka and equanimity in the third and fourth rupa jhanas. So eventually the progression through the bhajangas Sati becomes Sama Sati and concentration becomes Sama Samadhi. So there's, there's an interlinking in many different ways between these four ways of looking at the path. And you, you probably have your own thoughts on this and um, can work out correspondences to, to suit your, your own understanding. So I think that's enough from the talk side. So what I want to do is to first to sit for a short practice, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I would like you to go into your own practice. I won't give any changeover instructions. And to just see how you can deepen sati don't worry too much about the, the stages or the different jhanas start with the giving attention establish the basic form of sati that i've been talking about and then see how you can simply allow that to deepen and deepen into more and more stillness even to the point where you may find your breath wants to become so calm that it almost stops. At which point there's less and less distraction and you can feel the quality of sati becoming more all-encompassing. You don't have to worry about the jhana factors either. Sati itself, and this is quite a an interesting point for me. Sati you could be could be regarded as a very basic starting point, but as soon as you do that first step, you somehow are setting up the possibility of, of the whole lot, all of the Bojangas, all of what you've experienced or practiced in the past coming together into Samadhi. So you may start with a very basic level of sati but if you trust it and trust the tradition the connection the past through your teachers through the Bhuman, through back to the original talks on the bhajangas by the buddha then you can be very surprised sometimes uh, how your practice can develop okay so i'm going to leave this i'm going to leave this picture on for duration of the practice and i'll sound the bell at the beginning and I'll sound the bell at the end and go into your own practice until you hear the final bell. Probably not too long, maybe 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, everyone ready to begin?
Okay, so I don't know how it'll work with so many people if, if we take questions, but we can see how it goes. Uh, what is interesting is, you know, how sati is experienced when we practice meditation. So, after sitting, you come out of the sitting and you recollect the, the stillness. You're still in a space in that stillness which is not limited by the normal cognitive thinking. And so the kind of thoughts come up are, are quite interesting. So if anyone has anything that's occurred to you coming out of the practice and you want to share it, please do so. It may be something that no one needs to particularly respond to. Maybe that someone else comments and then someone else brings a comment. And then we might have a theme. So just to trust the process. Rosie? Hello, Paul. Hello. Um, I have a que um, an observation, really, um, about just about the relationship between um, attention and the relationship between that and mindfulness and concentration. Because what I noticed in practice, I was sort of verging in between slightly discursive mind where I was bringing to mind in practice some of the qualities that I'd seen on screen that you'd, you'd set out and I became aware of it almost like the summiter and um, of um, mindfulness and concentration being an overall vehicle being and that leading to the breath and how that's a kind of raft for crossing and that's helps to and but it's almost like I think what came to mind was how the bizarreness of this whole business of object and what you attend to because how uh, clever the whole setup is that uh, what am I actually doing? I'm not sort of directly focusing on, oh yes, it'd be nice to get to Nirvana this morning. Um, I'm not actually doing that. What am I, what the object that I'm giving, offering to myself to concentrate on, that seems to be something slightly different to mindfulness and concentration. So it was just kind of the third force. I think that's what I'm trying to say, is that I became aware of a, a third force that almost came into operation, or became, I became aware of because of the, the mindfulness and concentration, but how that third force can vary according to what I think about or what I bring to mind. I don't know. Peter? Yeah, okay. When, yeah, when a few thoughts arise in a well-gathered mindful space, they're kind of not, not as solid, not, not as sticky, more like clouds in the sky and it's easier for them to fall away. Uh, you're less clagged onto them, less identifying with them, but they can fall away. Z? Um, just very brief, really. The, the word that came to my mind um, during the practice, really, was presence um, as an alternative way of considering mindfulness, being just present and noticing what is present. That's all. Mm. Hmm. Well, I think even from those three different comments, coming from three different people's practices, you can see how even, even online there's a kind of common, common theme, which is very interesting. When we do this in the, on, a, on a meditation retreat, and everyone's in the same room and sharing the samadhi, if you like, then you can kind of understand how what comes up is relevant to the whole group but it's a it's an interesting to see that it can happen online with people so physically separated because again those things are, are connected i mean the way i see what you the three of you are commenting on and i suspect it probably resonates with everybody after that practice is that 
like Rosie describes a kind of fluidity around sometimes noticing what you might think is mindfulness, sometimes then noticing the varying object of that mindfulness. And then you mentioned a kind of third, a third position. So Peter mentions that the the thoughts that the, the whatever comes up is less sticky. Something is a bit freer. And Izzy is talking about the same thing in in, in a slightly different way. The um, presence is, I think, the third position. So the way I see it based on what I was talking about, when I show the diagram about the brain and how the most basic level, there's a, a subject and an object. That's our default, you know, certainly in everyday consciousness, we're always dealing with being self-conscious or object conscious fluctuation around. So when you go into meditation, the same process starts to happen, even though you're giving attention to the breath. There's an awareness of sometimes a moment of self-consciousness and then sometimes a moment of, of the object, the breath. But then um, emerging from it is this third position, which is different to sensory everyday consciousness. If I, next time or the time after, show you some of the activity in the brain, what starts off in the sensory consciousness is a back front dialogue carrying the sense of subject, object, and I am. It shifts at a certain point into something quite different, different to the conscious of this or that, into presence. So the third position, and the bit that is in the, is in the background for what you were saying, Peter, the third position for Rosie, and the sense of presence for Isabel, is, is describing exactly what happens as, as exactly a concentration. Merge and become more subtle, and gradually become aware of our consciousness. That's the first position, which is to be carried by the limiter. Um, and we're talking already then about going through, in some maybe not complete, far from complete way in this practice, but the, the beginnings of the whole process will be done. Yeah, so something about that development of jhana, really. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is fascinating, but it starts in such a very simple way by just the first stage, directing attention onto the breath. And then it gets more subtle and it gets deeper. And we start to settle into stillness, I think is the key to this. It's like the kind of all enveloping quality of sati. Um, Sati becomes more all-embracing and within it is more is a focus that develops an, an intensity and we're less distracted into thinking and feeling and I think it's at that point that we become able to start to notice the quality of our own consciousness not thinking about it to begin, with, to begin with, we might want to think about it. And sometimes after we come out of the practice, we try to recollect. It's easy to try and put words on, but you very quickly can lose the immediacy of the experience. That's why I suggest everyone when you're doing your own practice at home or in a group, when you come to the end, stay with the stillness before you mentally move and physically move. Stay with the stillness. But it's only by staying with it that you start to understand that there is, a, there is a, a consciousness and a connection to that consciousness which is beyond words, which is what um, is mentioned as presence. Hi.
I was just wondering, you know, we have that sense of peace, but what do you do with it? What do you do with what? The peace. The peace? Yeah. What's in the back of your mind, Gabby? Did you say that? I don't. What's in the back of my mind? What, what's at the back of that thought as you articulate it in that way? What, what's it mean to you? What's moved me? You know, what's it, what does it mean to you, the idea of the peace? Uh, well, the, prob the problem peace. is, I, I crave peace, I think particularly because things are very chaotic at home now. Yeah. And um, I can't have it. I can't have that quiet that I'm used to having because it's constant noise whether it's neighbours gathering in the street or my mm. children making a huge mm. racket all the time. So in a sense, that's causing suffering to want to have quiet and I can put my earplugs in and that can be great, it can be really effective for a while. Yeah. Or I can yeah. put music on. Music is very, very effective and the right kind of music. But you can get attached to that experience and that piece and that alone causes you suffering. Okay. I think this I think what you're mentioning is also very relevant to the people who are dealing with in self isolation and, and actually other situations. I mean Charles here has a very recent been working on the hospital war and dealing with a lot of the day to day effects on people. So there's a lot of there's a lot of potential suffering. Around. So, you may recall during all the problems now being self isolated that there are times where you might have found it easier to touch on the peace. And you may find it more difficult sometimes, but not all the time. So, I think the real lesson, and it's an opportunity, is to be patient with yourself and sometimes. You may do a practice and you can touch on it. And you come out of the practice and you, you notice the uh, dukkha around you. And it's an opportunity to, rather than running away from it or being frightened of it, and I think fear is a big, a big factor at the moment, just seeing it as a, as a vivid, raw example of what life is about, the alternation between suffering not there one moment if you touch on the peace and then suddenly something reminds you or disturbs you and suddenly suffering is back. The existence of suffering, it's arising, it's passing. So you're living the path of trying to understand how these processes work without being overwhelmed by them, without being trapped in them. And, and it's happening on so many levels now. I mean, I'm still working online, seeing patients and supervising other therapists who are seeing their patients. And it's really interesting how it brings up a lot of potential fear and suffering. But it also brings up a, a, a completely different perspective, which is an opportunity to, to realize where our attachments lie and to be kind of compassionate to ourselves, as well as everyone else who we see in the news is dying or suffering. So it's a bit like alchemy, you know, this is very raw. There's a, there's a lot of shit in the crucible, but there's also some, some, some potential kind of gold or riches there. I don't, I don't know how easily I can formulate this question, but it has sort of been on my mind Something to do with, um, again, that contrast between the, say, the, the um, peacefulness or whatever, however you describe the qualities of the practice, and then the awareness of, you know, what's going on in the world. Um, because sometimes it seems that the, those qualities of the practice can stay with one um, sometimes, a lot of the time and then part of me then starts feeling almost guilty for 
feeling okay, even though I know there's um, such a lot of suffering going on, that I can't quite. <laughs> I think that must be affecting a lot of people actually. Mm. With, the, with the news every day about the deaths and so forth. Mm. And it makes, you, makes me think of what, what does uh, opaca mean? Mm. You know, what does um, equanimity and opaca actually mean in practice? So does it mean that we're, we're kind of abandoning those people if we stay in opaca? Or do we still, are we still aware of the both sides, the suffering and the and the peacefulness or the happiness. I think it's it's a very important question actually that if you go to feel you have to embrace suffering and be part of it all the time, that's not going to be leave you in much scope to help to either yourself or other people. And if you go into the other extreme of of trying to hang on to the peace at all costs then again that's a kind of denial of reality so there has to be a middle position at least some of the time and i think that's the key thing that some of the time when things come together in the practice and you feel peace and stillness and you see it as opaque and you come out of your practice and you open your eyes and you're aware of what's going on in your house or in the street or in society on the news of course it can be either way it can be full of suffering but there are also there are also parts of it where people show some some really admirable qualities so i think the opaque is very important and not to feel guilty about it because it's not a cutting off mm. or being overwhelmed by a long way I think it's a misunderstanding about opaque. It's a matter of trusting. What does the stillness really mean? In terms of the kind of brain activity that I was showing before, it means shifting from the subject-object problem of everyday sensory consciousness to, to a different vertical axis of present, presence. And when you're describing sometimes feeling guilty about being happy, what actually you're talking about is the default world we live in, the subject object, is constantly in the presence of suffering. You know, which goes back to the, the origins of, of Buddhism and the, and the mm -hmm. attempts to do something about that, to detach, detach from that kind of formulation. So, at this time we've got to live with it, we've got to live within it, and it could go either way. But it's very, very helpful for meditators to use their experience of practice to, to practice that middle position of the paker, because you find that it's not only good for yourself, but it makes you actually more available yes. for people. I'm quite sure of that that it actually makes the connection more available, but also more direct. A lot of the therapists I, I work, supervise or work with are, are finding that in working with their patients online in this situation, patients who are, are isolated or confined, that when the connection comes, it's actually very poignant even though they're not in the same room. Mm. I would imagine you noticed the same thing, Francis, if you're having to work as a GP online. Yes, and I think that there's something, particularly at these sort of times, about um, a kind of cheerfulness. And even if it's not outer, there's a kind of inner cheerfulness yeah. Um, which people do um, do pick up on, mm. um, and also um, if there is an um, equanimity present to, with somebody who is kind of suffering, compassion um, and equanimity, that can almost be the most helpful of all because yeah. Then yeah. you sort of instinctively know how how to respond. 
Um, and I think the other thing is that sometimes um, <coughs> suffering may lead to joy. So um, <coughs> sometimes people have said to me, well, um, somebody died, but I felt happy. I, I, I did not feel sad. Mm. That's, and that's actually quite good. That's almost a kind of higher response in one sense. Yeah. Um, uh, mm. yeah. um, and there's almost, it's almost, though there's a lot of suffering, there is actually quite a lot of joy as well. I mean, the way people are, kind of come together and you get to talk to people you haven't talked to, neighbours, and the way yeah. there's so much kind of um, kindness towards others mm. and, and also helpfulness towards others. I mean, that will naturally lead to um, joy um, yeah. arising because you'll be appreciating other people's yeah. skillful action. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else is feeling this, but, um, you know, we're meeting in cyberspace, but I've had a very powerful feeling of connectedness with the group. Mm -hmm. It feels like I am with the Sangha. I almost forgot we weren't all in the same room. Mm -hmm. And I felt it in the practice as well. So I think there's something really interesting about us just intentionally being together, you know, across big spaces, really. Mm. Yeah, that's all I yeah. wanted to say, yeah. yeah. I think also connected to that comment, in the same way that we can connect as a sangha across spaces, I think we shouldn't underestimate, even though we're self-isolated, how much we are connected to what is going on out mm. there. We're talking about it as though it's not here, it's out there. And we're watching TV and hearing all these horrendous figures. But I don't think we should underestimate how much we are actually and deeply affected mm. in our isolation, in our isolation, in what is going on out there. Um, and I suppose that leads to the thought of wondering, really, you know, what effect our practice, um, whatever form it takes, can have on those out there mm. in cyberspace. Yeah. Hey, I'm Chris from Auburn, Alabama. I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, putting this on Zoom. I okay. So I look forward to um, seeing you again. Maybe in a week or so. Maybe in a week. Okay. Thank you.